Uh, good morning. Today is Monday, October 12th, 2020. Uh, we are uh, reaching the end of this third section. Uh, we are going to finish our uh, discussion of bone physiology today in lecture and then uh, start our discussion with the joints. I will warn you ahead of time. I think the joints are the part of this section that I think people have the most trouble with, not because I necessarily think it is more challenging. I think it's the vocabulary. Right, when we're talking about you know synchondrosis and symphyses and gumphoses and things along those lines, it gets a little tricky. Uh, there is a great handout. Uh, again, your book actually does a really good job with this section, but there's also a handout on uh, in your module that kind of distills all of the uh, material for the joints. Because again, it's one of those things where we have to relate things the same way when we talked about our uh, glands as having a structural classification and a functional classification. And those things are obviously related to each other. The same thing is going to be true for our joints. Oh, that's cool. Thank you for, for, uh, for offering that information, Haley. That's great. Uh, so that's our game plan for today. Then also in lab, we will start our appendicular group presentations. You guys did an amazing job the last time, a wealth of information, and uh, which is really awesome. But again, remember, we do want to focus on the key parts, which is just the bones and bone features. Uh, like I said, knowing that the carotid artery goes through the carotid canal helps us to remember it, but it isn't something I'm going to test you on as well. Now with the appendicular skeleton, the bone features that articulate we do not only need to know this bone feature, but we also know how it relates to that as well. So that is definitely something we're going to be wanting to emphasize over the next two days as we're going through these appendicular group presentations. The muscle attachment points, uh, you know, the other holes and things along those lines aren't going to be as much of a concern. We don't have to worry about those functions yet, but we definitely need to know the functions of the articulating points. We do have two more assignments due. Uh, first is your unit nine review. Uh, that is due, uh, same as it ever was. And I've decided, again, since we are online, to take advantage of the fact that we are online. There are many uh, 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 challenges to being online, but I figure we should take advantage of the few benefits as well. So I've decided to move the 30-point skeletal review. Since we will still have uh, bones and bone features to talk about on Wednesday, I've decided it is more beneficial to move the assignment. Again, if you've turned it in, you're welcome to. You're welcome to also change it as well if you'd like. I don't normally like having homework assignments due on days when we don't meet because I, 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 my fear is that it is too easy to forget it. Uh, but I think in this case, I think it is worthwhile enough. So we will do have it due Friday at eight o'clock. Obviously, as soon as you get it done, finish it Wednesday afternoon after class or whatever it is, do everything but the leg, the leg part or whatever, whenever, but it is gonna be due Friday at 8 a.m. If you forget and turn it in at 8.05, it is late and late assignments are half credit. So you will only get 15 points for that. So it is very, very important to pay attention to that. Uh, be sure you're aware of that, uh, but I do think that extra time hopefully will be beneficial for you guys. Again, I wanna make sure that I didn't wanna have it due on Monday, the day of the test, uh, because I want you to be able to turn it in and then also be able to access the key to that uh, so that you can see what you got right and what you got wrong. Because anything, again, being the smart, sophisticated students you are, if we have a 30-point assignment that is graded for correctness, do you think that questions that related to this are going to be on the lab and the lecture exam? Yeah, absolutely. So make sure. So I want to make sure you have the key so that make sure you understand the information, what was correct and what was wrong from your own. Uh, so that because obviously I'm not going to have it graded and back to you before the exam, but you will have the key to access for that as well. And like I said, one week from today is your lab and lecture exam three. You've already taken two of these. You know exactly what to expect from those. It must be completed during the class time. You can do them in any order, but I do encourage you to do the lab exam first because uh, there are uh, more questions and more um, computer challenging questions because of all of the graphics and the, the, the processing that needs to go, the loading speeds and things along those lines. But again, you're welcome to do them in any order that you want. We are doing good on time. Uh, so again, we'll see how long the bones and bone features take, but uh, my expectation is that Wednesday we will finish early. Uh, what that means is that there should be some time for question and answer review. 
Again, what that means is not me standing up here telling you what I think is important. That's what I do every day in class. But this is your opportunity to ask questions about material that you're not clear about, processes or other content uh, that can help you to be successful on the exam. And I'm happy that we'll work together to answer those. So you should have some questions prepared for that. Remember, if we have a review and nobody asks us questions, then I assume that you've all mastered the material and I make the exams harder. All right. Questions on any of that? All right, excellent. Then my stun silences, which I love so much, allows us to move on to lecture. All righty. Perfect. So as I've mentioned, we've been working our way through bone homeostasis, our bone physiology. We learned two ways to make bones. What are the two ways to make bones? No, what are the two ways that we need to make bones? Chondrial ossification and membranous ossification. Yeah, endochondrial ossification and intramembranous ossification. Excellent. All right. We learned two ways to grow bones. And now, Alina, you can answer your question that way. You want to say it again? Or should I just read it off what you wrote? Length and width. Although, let's be a little bit more precise. What was the growth process we used to grow bones in length? What was the growth process? If only we had learned growth processes, like how they related to cartilage. Excellent, interstitial growth, spectacular. And then for growth in width, what was the growth process we used for that? Compositional growth. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And again, one of the awesome things about that process of appositional growth that grows our bones in width it is also what forms our osteons and therefore forms our compact bones. Excellent. And lastly, we learned that there are three main factors that play an important role in the maintenance of our bones. What were they? Exercise, nutrition, and hormones. Excellent. Exercise, nutrition, and hormones. Excellent. And hopefully some of you actually this weekend, I ran out and got those wintergreen lifesavers or had them um, uh, grub hubbed to your house and hide yourself in a closet and uh, with a mirror and got a chance to experience those sparks. Excellent. And not only that, but we also talked about the role that calcium plays in uh, the homeostasis of our bone as well. And how when it comes down to calcium levels and healthy bones, calcium levels are always going to win. That means the only major homeostatic process that we need to talk about for bones is to repair that bone. Of course, if we're going to repair the bone, we have to damage the bone first. So let's talk first about the different ways that we can break a bone or form what we call fractures. Now, as you can see from this illustration from your textbook, there are a wide variety of different types of fractures that can occur, but all fractures pretty much fall into one of two categories, what we call a closed fracture or an open fracture, or what are also sometimes referred to as simple and compound. How do we define a closed versus an open fracture? Open fractures are those fractures that they torn the, the skin. They're yeah, excellent. Perfect, exactly. An open fracture is a fracture where the bone is actually penetrated through the surface of the skin. So if the bone is, is, is penetrated through the surface of the skin, then we consider that an open fracture. If it stays contained within the skin, then we call it a closed or a simple fracture. Excellent. So again, all of our fractures can fall under one of those two categories. But as you can see from the illustration, there are several different classifications of fractures. All right, let's talk about the first and most basic of these, and that is a transverse fracture. If you were asked to define a transverse fracture, how would you do that? Transverse fracture is that that happens transversely. Sure. The building is tall because it is tall, but what does it mean to be transverse? If this is my long bone, 
what it, would a transverse fracture be? How would it relate to it? Okay, I like that straight across. Straight across is a good example. And really, I think the easiest way to think of it is in terms of a transverse fracture is basically a fracture that is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, All right? Especially with our long bones. Our long bones have a longitudinal axis and a transverse fracture is a fracture that goes basically perpendicular to it, straight across. Now, notice mine here, I've just broken it in half. However, this one up here that we look at on the uh, x-ray, you can see that there's a difference between them. In this case, the bones have been misaligned. And is there a fancy word we give for it when it has been misaligned like that? Well, I'm asking the question, so the obvious answer should be yes. And what would that be? displaced, exactly. So many, not all of our fractures, but many of the fractures that we'll talk about have the potential to be displaced. And if it's displaced, then that means that the bone is no longer aligned. Uh, so there's been a breaking of the bone and also a misalignment of the bone as well. All right. Excellent. Questions on that? How all right. How do you define the transverse uh, fracture, sir? And so a transverse fracture is a fracture that occurs perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the bone. Does the text call it transverse? I'm not seeing that classification in the book. Well, it, if I look at the illustration right here, transverse fractures. I'm not sure what else it would call it. It's just not on this page. Um, what page are you on? Oh, interesting. You are correct in that they don't have, doesn't appear to have transverse on there, but obviously transverse is one of the main types. I'm not sure why that's not there. Maybe in the text it talks about transverse fractures, what it is as being across. Uh, we've got positional, complete break, closed, reduction, open. I didn't see it in the, on page 191 either. Yeah. For yeah. The okay. Well, okay. Well, whether that's that is very odd, but I promise you that a uh, transverse is one of the main uh, classifications of a fracture. So please be sure to understand that. And again, it's one of the simplest of them. That may be why it wasn't emphasized in that fashion. But that is what a uh, uh, a like I said, it is basically a vertical fracture along the longitudinal axis. Okay, so thank you for catching that. It's weird that it doesn't say that, uh, but uh, it definitely is one of the main classifications of a fracture. But it does look like your book does a nice job of talking about the other ones. So let's talk about some of the other types. Uh, first being a comminuted fracture. A comminuted fracture, as you can see, is defined by a fracture where the bone is broken into more than two bones. So again, when we have that bone and we had that just a simple transverse fracture, that one bone basically becomes two bone pieces. With a comminuted fracture, you are going to get three or more pieces of that form in that. So in this way, you kind of get a shattering of the bone as a result of this comminuted fracture. So you get three or more uh, pieces to this. This occurs when the bones get more brittle. Again, as we've talked about, one of the things that continues to happen to our bones during our life is we deposit more and more hydroxyapatite crystals in there, ossifying it. So there's less and less collagen fibers. And less collagen fibers, of course, means that there is going to be a less flexibility, less give to the bone. 
So these types of fractures are much more common in older bones as we age. So we keep making the joke about how when grandma rolls off the changing table, she shatters. The reason she shatters is she has less collagen in her bone and her, bo her bones typically break in a common muted fracture. All right, questions on that one. All right, the next type of fracture is what is known as a spiral fracture. Uh, notice, as you can see again, and I'm not even going to attempt to draw this because of my horrible drawing skills, let alone the fact that I have to do it on the computer. But as you can see, there is a twisting and very jagged uh, break to the bone with this type of fracture. This is typically caused by a rapid twisting of the bone. Again, I don't know if the diagnosis is in, but I don't know if how many of you are watching the Cowboys game this weekend, uh, but the quarterback for the Cowboys at one point late in the game, uh, had his foot facing in the wrong direction and had a compound fracture of some type to his ankle. Uh, my guess is based on the way he was tackled, it was probably due to a type of spiral type of fracture like this, where you get an excessive twisting force. It can occur in a tackle where he was rolled up like on as he was in that football game. Uh, sometimes you see this with uh, like soccer players, they step in a gopher hole and there is a twisting of the foot, something along those lines that occurs. And occasionally you see this in children as well, right? Little Timmy is bouncing on the couch and is about to fall onto the glass coffee table and mom grabs and pulls and as she grabs and pulls you get a twisting of the arm and that can cause a spiral fracture at least that's what you tell child protective services all right so these types of excessive twisting cause these spiral like fractures to occur A compression fracture is a very different type of fracture. Notice with this compression fracture, essentially what's happening, and notice it's uh, not uncommon when these occur for them to occur in the vertebral column. These occur because of two different accelerating forces, right? A downward and an upward force. So what happens is you're riding on your skateboard or you're riding on your roller blades and your feet go out from under you. And so you start accelerating down towards the ground and then you hit the ground. And as that occurs, you get that uh, dual forces, the upward and inward force that causes a compression of the bone where the bone is actually crushed in between. You get a pulverizing of the bone from those two forces. Again, falls is a common way that this occurs. And as you can see, it happens in those vertebral columns. Now, when you have the crushing of the bone of this, is this gonna heal as simply as uh, just a transverse fracture is going to? No, this is much more challenging uh, for because of the injury to the bone, let alone the fact that it's in your vertebral column, which is supposed to give you your vertical axis, and there's constant tension on it. Uh, so uh, often when these would occur, people were put in traction, where basically they had forces pulling on their head and forces pulling on their legs to try to help to take some of the tension off the vertebral column. And nowadays, in most instances, they will have to input some type of rod or something to, uh, from actually from the superior vertebral uh, bone to the inferior one to help to kind of stabilize uh, that structure because it is not an easy bone uh, for it to be able to heal. Like I said, these types of traumas, these types of falls are where these commonly occur within the vertebral column. But there is one other interesting location where you will sometimes see these occur. And these are in people who have failed in suicide attempts. Again, obviously this probably happens in people who are successful in their suicide attempts. But if you're successful in the suicide attempt, a broken bone is the least of your concerns. However, you get someone who jumps off of a bridge feet first towards the water. And so once again, you have that acceleration downward. And then when you're coming off the bridge, hitting that water, that water is harder than concrete. You can often get these types of compression fractures that will occur within the long bones of the leg as a result of hitting the ground, hit, not hitting the ground, but hitting the water in that failed suicide attempt. And so they often, uh, 
sort of thankfully survive the uh, the suicide attempt, but as a result of that, can actually have major fractures. These compression fractures to their legs can af affect their ability to be able to walk and recover from that. So is it best to just dive in? <laughs> um, it's best not to kill yourself. How about that? <laughs> a great and very depressing question. Uh, yes. Does, so does it, if somebody's diving, so he or she might have like uh, cervical fractures or head fractures, head trauma? So, are, I mean, well, it, it depends on what you mean by diving. If one of the things that you, again, water has a very magical quality and that magical quality to it is surface tension, right? Because it has a polarity to it, it gets a surface tension to the surface. So if you've noticed that diving competitions and things along those lines, one of the things they do is they have a, a, a spout of water that spritz water into the pool, breaking up that surface tension to reduce the force uh, when someone is taking a, a normal dive. Uh, so yes, but obviously it, the, the farther you fall to hit that water, that surface tension can, like I said, can actually be stronger than concrete by the time you hit it, depending on, on the distance you're traveling before hitting that water, which is why you're not supposed to be jumping off bridges and things along those lines uh, for fun, all right? Now notice with this compression fracture, we have the two forces coming down uh, towards each other. Well, one coming down and one going up. Uh, this is different from a depression fracture. With a depression fracture, the force is just coming from one direction. So you get this force coming from just one direction, right? For the umpteenth time, your wife has told you to take out the garbage and you have forgotten to take out the garbage yet again. So she has tried to decide to encourage you to take out the garbage with a hammer. And when she hits you in the head with that hammer, that puts basically an indentation from the force coming in one side to the bone. And so you have that depression fracture. These typically occur in the skull because these are the flatter bones from either people hitting you in the head with a heavy hammer for not taking out the garbage or falling off a bike, falling off a skateboard, falling off your rollerblades without wearing a helmet and you hit the ground as a result of that and get those depression types of fractures. However, while they typically occur in the skull, if you see your significant other coming at you with the hammer, you may put up your arm as a defense and then obviously those types of depression fractures could occur there as well. They're just not quite as common, but they, they are common as defensive wounds. Uh, but uh, they're not common from falls or things along those lines. Bar mm -hmm. fights, there you go, exactly. Excellent. Now, we talked about how uh, those common muted fractures are fractures that commonly occur in elderly people. Uh, what we have here is a fracture that is much more common, well, it really only happens in adolescents because one of the big key differences between adolescents and adults is adolescents still have epiphyseal plates, right? If you have an epiphyseal plate, again, as we've talked about and you think about it, we have that and we can draw a Dino bone here. That thin line of hyaline cartilage in the epiphyses of our bones. And uh, hyaline cartilage is weaker than bone is. So a stressor at just the right, or I guess just the wrong angle, depending on how you think of it, can actually take advantage of that weakness and cause a fracture that occurs right at the epiphyseal plate. Right. Now, obviously, no fracture is a good type of fracture, but this is a particularly worrisome fracture when this occurs to with an adolescent. And why would that be the case? Stop their growth. Right. One of the things that can happen during the healing of this epiphyseal break is that the epiphyseal plate can actually ossify prematurely, which means that at this end of this bone, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. At this end of this bone, suddenly it stops growing in length. 
it still keeps growing at length at the other end. But where are our long bones located again? Yeah, our appendages, excellent. Excellent, right? All of our appendages. So water is you may break the epiphyseal plate of one humerus, you didn't of the other. And so you only have one functioning epiphyseal plate in your left arm and two functioning epiphyseal plates in your right arm. And suddenly you're buying custom made shirts for the rest of your life. Right, so often, often when you have that fracture right next to the epiphyseal plate, uh, the doctors are a little bit more concerned about it. There really isn't much they can do. They do monitor it a little bit more closely, uh, but uh, there really isn't that much they can do to stop it from happening. They just want to be aware if it occurs uh, so that, uh, again, that you, you can plan accordingly, I guess. I'm not really sure. But just yeah. like that clavicle bone as well? Uh, it, the clavicle bone is... is uh, Yes, would be another example where that would occur as well. Although I don't believe that the fractures of the clavicle are more common near the epiphyseal plates. I'm not saying that it can't occur at that location, but I think it happens more towards the center of the uh, diaphysis. So it might not be as it occurred. But yeah, any long bone, uh, you run the risk of having that break near or at the epiphyseal plate, and that can cause a problem with it. Absolutely. Right. And again, we keep talking about the arms and custom made shirts, but if you think about it, if it happens in the legs, it's even more concerned because then now your feet are going to be, you know, one leg is going to be longer than the other. And so you have to wear special shoes and it's going to affect your gait. And as we talked about how you walk affects how your osteons align. And so again, all sorts of complications can occur because of that. Now, epiphyseal fractures are not the only ones that occur in adolescence. The other is a green stick fracture, right? This weekend, it was nice and chilly. So you had that fire in your backyard. So you wanted to get out the s'mores. And when it was time to get out the s'mores, did you go up to that new sapling tree that you planted over the weekend and try to break off one of its nice young limbs to use that to roast your marshmallow? No, is that gonna be easy to do? Is it easy to break a limb off a sapling? No, because it bends, it's flexible. Right, And if you keep bending and flexing it, eventually it starts to shred and eventually it comes apart, but it's really hard to do. And the reason for that is because on those saplings, the cell walls have not fully solidified yet. And so it isn't as hard and it is much more flexible, much more bendable. Well, it's the same thing is true with our adolescent bones. As we've talked about, our bones are much more collagenous uh, when we are younger. And so they have much more flexibility and much more give. And that's really the key to a green stick type of fracture. What happens is like with most fractures, there is a force on the bone that causes the bone to break. And so we get the formation of a cracking that occurs in the bone from that force. But because of the flexibility of this bone, because of all of the collagen, what ends up happening is that rather than breaking, the bone actually compresses on the other side. So what happens is we get a break on one side, but we get a compression on the other side. And that compression keeps the fracture from going all the way through. So what happens is you get this incomplete break where the bone only breaks on one side and basically bends on the other. On the other side. And when that occurs, much like that sapling, sometimes you can get a shredding of the uh, bone matrix on the break side as a result of that. Again, blowing these pictures up big, I lost a little bit of the resolution, but as you look at the pictures in the textbook, they little, look a little bit bigger, a little bit better. And you can kind of see a little bit of the shredding that has occurred within uh, this uh, fracture of this example. Now, obviously this can only occur uh, when the bones are still flexible, when, the, when it is in children. This very, very rarely occurs in adults because our bones aren't flexible enough to bend, to compress like that. All right, questions on that? With the green stick, because it's a young bone also, can that, I'm sorry, not the green stick. 
And of any of the other kinds of fractures in young people, can this bone shredding occur also? No. Um, no, typically, okay, if, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess like for instance, with a, with a spiral fracture, you maybe could get some shredding or something like that. Um, but I think it more has to do just with the separation of it as it bends and flexes. So I, 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 def, I, I, I think it's something that is somewhat unique to the green stick. All right. So those are all of our different classifications of fractures. Questions on that? Now, if we've learned anything, it's the well, two things. It's that anatomists hate us and that they love to name everything, right? And so it's not surprising that there are some special fractures that are given specific names. There are actually a lot of them. But what I wanna do is talk about two of the more common ones. The first, as you can see here, is a Coles fracture. A Coles fracture, as you can see here, is a break that occurs. It is a transverse fracture near the uh, distal epiphysis of the radius. Uh, one of the keys to the Coles fracture is that it may or may not include uh, the uh, ulna. So to be considered a Coles fracture, it doesn't have to include the ulna, but if it is, does include the ulna, it doesn't necessarily have to um, uh, preclude it from being a Coles fracture. And as you can see from the illustration, this typically occurs from someone trying to catch themselves when they fall. Right, so what happens is, you know, you're rollerblading or something like that and you fall forward. And as you fall forward, you put your hand out to catch yourself as you fall. And as you pull your hand out to catch yourself in the fall, that force causes that fracture of the radius near the distal epiphysis from catching yourself with a fall. And when that occurs, they call that a Coles fracture. So technically it's a transverse fracture near the distal epiphysis of the radius and potentially the ulna from catching yourself with a fall. And if you meet those criteria, you've had a Coles fracture. However, my favorite fracture is the Potts fracture. A Potts fracture is similar to the Coles in that what happens is you have a fracture that occurs uh, near the distal epiphysis. So. And really plural epiphyses of both the tibia and the fibula. So both have to be involved in this one. And typically this occurs from a twisting or bending of the ankle. So this is the example that we talked about. If you step in that gopher hole and it twists your ankle, breaking both of the bones. Or what can happen is you're walking down the street. And as you're walking down the street, talking animately with the person next to you, you're not really paying attention to where your foot is going. And so what happens is your foot lands on the edge of the curb. And as your foot lands on the edge of the curb, it causes your foot to twist downward, breaking those two bones and you fall to the ground, which is exactly what happened to Dr. Bob Potts. He was walking and animally talking with some of his friends, stepped on the edge of the curb, twisted and broke his ankle at both points uh, both bones near the distal epiphyses and said, hey, while I'm sitting here writhing in pain, this would be really fun to write up for a medical journal. And that's what he did. And they named the fracture after him. So the Potts fracture is named after good old Bob Potts who uh, broke his foot walking down the street. There's also a, a disease like tuberculosis of the uh, vertebral co column It's called Potts. Well, so one of the things that I'll point out is many of these anatomists are uh, what we affectionately like to refer to as whores. Basically, they love to describe things and they love to plant their flag in it. Purkinje, uh, Cajal, 
many of, especially in, in the neuroscience field, many of these anatomists, right, they wanted their popularity, they wanted their fame. And so as soon as they discovered something, they planted their name in it. So yeah, so you see pots in lots of different places. Uh, like I said, we're going to run into Purkinje fibers at least twice in this class. Um, and, and lots of other places as well. So it's not uncommon. And that's part of the problem with anatomy. When you call something a pot's fracture, it doesn't tell you anything about it, right? It gives pots another nickel in his pocket, but it doesn't tell us anything. So one of the things that they've very slowly been working their way towards is changing the vocabulary in anatomy and physiology to things that are more meaningful. So instead of Merkel discs, we now have tactile cells. Instead of Pacinian corpuscles, we now have lamellated corpuscles. But it is very, very slow. It's a slow process. These antiquated terms, which aren't helpful or useful, uh, are very hard to get rid of. All right. I don't know if they see it like as a rite of passage. You know, when I was in grad school, I had to learn all these stupid things. So you have to as well. I don't, I don't know what the rationale behind it is, but it is a slow process of change. All right. All the fun and exciting ways uh, that we can break a bone. Questions on that? All right. Now that we have broken a bone, let's go through the process of healing it. Now, obviously there is going to be some variations in this process, depending on what type of fracture it is, but we will start with the simplest of fractures. Uh, we will look at, um, what do you mean by pathological fractures? Like when bones are broken because of the presence of a tumor or disease. Uh, no, we're, we're not, I mean, yes, the, those types of things can occur, absolutely. Uh, what I would say to that is, again, just to remember that in this class, the sky is blue, right? Every single topic we ever talk about in this class is far more complicated than we have the opportunity to go into detail on in this class. So, uh, so yes, there's the, everything, everything, literally everything we talk about is more complicated uh, than we have the chance. So we're just trying to look at the basic sky is blue answers to most of these things. All right, here is the diaphysis of my long bone and let's go ahead and give it a fracture. For simplicity, we will go with a simple transverse fracture there. Although I haven't quite finished my anatomy yet because as we know, on the outer surface of this is going to be a periosteum. So let's put that periosteum in place. And we know that periosteum houses mesenchymal cells. All right, and then of course also we know there's going to be a medullary cavity in the center. Oops, hold on, I want that to be black. Medullary cavity. And that of course, contains our red bone marrow or yellow bone marrow. Excellent. So there's my medullary cavity containing bone marrow. Here is my periosteum with mesenchymal cells. Excellent. And then we have our fracture. Now, one of the things that we know is that our blood, our bone is very well vascularized. So when we break our bone, right, there are a lot of nerves in here, so we know it's gonna hurt like heck. but we're also gonna disrupt a lot of blood vessels. And so one of the things that is going to happen is that as those blood vessels burst, this area is going to fill with a large amount of blood. And what do we call that swelling of blood that occurs within the region? Hematoma. 
hematoma. Yeah, exactly. So the first thing that is going to occur is we get a hematoma formation. We get that inflammation, we get that swelling, we get pain. Remind me again, why is that pain important? Because of the nerves? Well, nerves are why we feel the pain, but why is the fact that it becomes painful, why is that important? No, right, sir, sir. Say again? Right, yeah, you want to know that you're injured, right? If you've broken your bone, are you necessarily going to want to go run a 5K after that? You probably shouldn't, right? And you probably aren't going to want to because of the pain, absolutely, that is going to occur. Right, so that, all of that is important, but something else bad happens in here as well. Obviously, the bone that has been directly damaged is damaged by this process, but when we bur burst those blood vessels as a result of that damage, that disrupts the blood flow. As a result of this, not only does the damaged bone die, but also some peripheral bone tissue will die as well. So what's gonna end up happening is that because we've disrupted the blood vessels that are going to this part of the bone, this part of the bone right here is gonna die. And this part of the bone over here is going to die. So not only is the part that is damaged going to die as a result of it, but we are going to get the disruption of blood flow to an area. And as a result of that, other bone is going to die as well. We're going to get some peripheral damage from that as well. Excellent. So first step is that hematoma formation. Big, swollen, painful chunk of blood, right? Some dead uh, and damaged bone in the area. But luckily we can start the healing process. And that is going to start with our friends, the mesenchymal cells. And so of course, as we know, mesenchymal cells can divide to become any type of cell we want them to, to form. So of course, since we've broken a bone, our mesenchymal cells are going to divide and produce new, what kind of cells? Blood vessels. Well, you're right, blood vessels will grow back into this area, but the mesenchymal cells, the mesenchymal cells Plastic are going to become, right? We have broken bone here, so what kind of cells? I think I heard it say it again. Osteoblasts. Exactly. These are going to divide and form new fibroblasts and chondroblasts. Wait, what? We have broken bone here. Don't we want osteoblasts to form? Yeah, we do, but it turns out that's not what happens first. The first thing that happens is we form new fibroblasts. And remind me again, what do fibroblasts make? Fibers, and not just any fibers, but collagen fibers in this case. And what do chondroblasts make? Cartilage. They make cartilage. Exactly. And so that's what ends up occurring. Here inside of the injury, what's going to happen is our fibroblasts and chondroblasts are going to start to fill this tissue, fill this space with a cartilage a big chunk of cartilage. And this big chunk of cartilage that forms here is going to have a massive amount of collagen fibers. So many collagen fibers that you can actually see those collagen fibers under the microscope. So what type of cartilage is made here? Fibrocollagenous. There you go. The type of cartilage that is made here is fibrocartilage. We make a big chunk of fibrocartilage. 
And this big chunk of fibrocartilage that forms is what is known as the fibrocartilaginous callus or the fibrocartilaginous cap. This cartilage stabilizes the injury, right? Forming that stabilized structure. And luckily, we know how to convert cartilage into bone. And so since again, we know how these processes work, once we figured out how to do something, we're gonna use it as many times as we can. And that's what's gonna happen here as well. Depending on the injury, the type of injury, the location of the injury, this fibrocartilaginous cap can form in as little as a couple hours. Now, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but many of you are aware of it. Because your best friend, Billy, was playing football with his buddies on Saturday, right back in ancient times when we were allowed to play with our friends. And he got tackled and his arm hurt, but he's a man, so he can't admit it. But Tuesday has rolled around and his arm still hurts. And so he goes in the doctor, they take an x-ray, find out it's broken. And what's often one of the first things the doctor has to do before he sticks him in a cast? Unstabilize. Uh, stabilize, stabilize or make it immovable. Well, uh, that's what the cast does, but what do they have to do before that? Re-break it. Re it, right? When they re-break the bone, they're not actually breaking the bone. When they re-break these bones, what they're doing is breaking up this fibrocartilaginous callus. Because what happens is it's been four days since Billy went to the doctor. And what are the chances that the two ends of his bones are perfectly aligned when that fibrocartilaginous cap formed? Probably not that likely. So what was happened was the bone was slightly misaligned. And if the bone was misaligned, we certainly don't want it to heal that way. But this is how the fibrocartilaginous cap has formed. So what the doctor has to do is break apart that fibrocartilaginous callus, realign the bone properly so that a new callus can form with it aligned and it can heal from there. So like I said, depending on the break, it can occur in a couple hours. So it is very common that they have to re-break the bone. But again, they're not really re-breaking the bone. What they're doing is breaking up this fibrocartilaginous callus so that the bone can be properly aligned. How is that done exactly? Force. Just pull on it or? Yeah, pull on it. I mean, again, it depends on the location. Uh, sometimes, depending on the location, they'll use a little, uh, they have a little mallet that they'll use to try to break it up or things along those lines. Uh, often it's a, a traction where they'll just try to pull it apart so that they can realign it. it. It really depends on the location and the severity of the break. But, but yeah, sometimes they just have to brute force it. All right, excellent. So now we have the bones stuck together. Again, with cartilage, that doesn't necessarily help us, but the good news is we know how to turn cartilage into bone. And that's exactly what's gonna happen next. So our goal now, so let's think of this here, we'll go goal first, is to now convert uh, the cartilage into bone. We know the steps that go along in this. Our chondrocytes enlarge and die. and they leave behind a calcified matrix. So our goal is to get rid of that matrix. And what would we use to do that? If only we had cells that could break down things like that. Osteoclasts. There you go, exactly. So osteoclasts actively remove matrix. So those osteoclasts uh, da, 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 here and here and here are going to break down that cartilage that's been calcified. And 
will break down any of that dead and damaged bone as well. So our osteoclasts are gonna come in and they're gonna break down that cartilage. They're gonna break down the dead and damaged bone, removing that matrix, removing the dead bone tissue. Actually, let's put that there. And then of course our osteoblasts are gonna come in, make new bone matrix. Now, of course, when they make this new bone matrix, is it gonna be perfectly aligned, uh, perfectly um, organized osteons that are gonna be forming? Not yet. No. So what it does is it fills this space with a big chunk of spongy bone. And so these actively uh, osteoblasts form a big chunk of spongy bone. And this big chunk of spongy bone that forms is what we call the bony callus or the bony cap forms. Now, notice at this point, our bone, does it look exactly like what it did before? Not quite. No, absolutely not. However, this is typically when the cast comes off. Why would this be when we want the cast to come off? So that it can, um, so that, oh, sorry, so that it can um, uh, heal better, heal yeah. the fracture better? Exactly. Remember, one of the three factors that we talked about that helps in the maintenance of bone is stress. At this point, our bone can handle a moderate amount of stress. Now, again, are you going to want to go running that 5K race at this point? No, but can you walk a mile around your neighborhood? Yeah, absolutely. And as we know, that stress is going to be important for strengthening and realigning the bone and the osteons. So that bony callus forms, and now it can handle moderate amount of stress. Now we're going to be able to put some force on it. Of course, we still have to remodel the bone, and that is the fourth step. Again, de depending on the location and the severity of the injury, this can take months to years for this to occur. But there are basically three goals. We want to reform the original shape. We want to form compact bone on the outer surface. And don't forget, if you look at our model, we need to hollow out the medullary cavity. But if everything goes well, after you know months to years, you're gonna get this nice organized compact bone on the outer surface. You're gonna get a nice smooth outer surface giving the normal shape and formation of the bone. And we are going to hollow out the medullary cavity where there's a little bit of spongy bone on the surface and then all that compact bone has formed as well. So we have a nice big thick compact bone that's formed out here, little bit of spongy bone and a medullary cavity. At which point the bone looks like it did before. In fact, 
It might even be a little bit better. In most cases, and again, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, the bone is typically stronger at the location than it was before. Meaning that the bone is actually more likely to um, break in a different location than at this one. Laura, that's a great question. In, when a bone has fully healed, often a superficial um, observation of the bone won't show the fracture because it will completely have remodeled on the outside. And so it actually takes an x-ray to see that the bone has been broken. In the area where the bone is broken, typically the compact bone is thicker in that region. The medullary cavity is a little bit more narrow in that region. And that's one of the reasons why it's stronger in that area because it typically has more compact bone in that area. And so that thickened compact bone and that more narrow medullary cavity is really the only way we can tell that bone has been broken. And obviously we need to look at the inside of the bone to see that. So with an X-ray, we can see old breaks to bones, but often by the time they heal, it can't be seen on the outer surface. All right. Excellent. As always, I've done a truly amazing job of showing this, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook and go through all of this again. Again, we have the formation of that fracture hematoma. Here we see that disruption of the blood vessels that have occurred. Uh, so our blood vessels burst. Dead bone forms in the area because of that disruption of the blood flow. We get that big painful swelling that tells us, hey, we are injured, don't use this. Now notice in both my picture and the illustration from your textbook, right? it shows the periosteum as being fully intact. If this fracture is displaced or is even an open fracture, is it likely that the uh, periosteum will be damaged from that? Yeah, but whatever periosteum remains is still gonna house those immature cells. So we'll still be able to see the healing process. Now, once it's become damaged, cells in the periosteum become active. Those mesenchymal cells divide, but they don't form what we think they would form. Instead, they form fibroblasts and chondroblasts. The fibroblasts make fibers, the chondroblasts make cartilage. And so we get a big, huge chunk of fibrocartilage that forms in this. This callus or cap stabilizes the bone and gives us a matrix where we can heal the bone from. Because if there's one thing we've learned how to do, it is convert cartilage into bone. And that is exactly what's going to happen. Our osteoblasts and osteoclasts become very, very active. We remove all the dead and damaged bone, either the bone that has been directly damaged or the bone that has been damaged from a loss of blood supply. And so we remove that with our osteoclasts and then our osteoblasts fill the space with a big chunk of spongy bone, what we call our bony callus. Like I mentioned, the bone isn't fully healed at this point, but this is typically when our, um, when our uh, cast comes off, because at this point we actually want to be able to put some moderate stress on it. Again, when you break your arm, you shouldn't start doing those 250 pound, you know, bench presses right away, right? You need to work up to it. So Allison started like 175 before you go all the way up to that, right? But uh, again, it can handle moderate stress and that stress is gonna be a good thing. And then again, depending on the severity and the type of injury, it may take months, it may take years, but those osteoblasts and osteoclasts are gonna stay active so that only compact bone remains on the outer surface. We can get a narrowing of the uh, uh, medullary cavity that isn't really fully shown here, 
but and like I said, in most cases, the bone is typically as strong or stronger at that location than it was prior to the fracture. All right, questions on that? All right, with that then, we are finally done with our bone physiology. That is everything we need to talk about from a bone physiology standpoint. Let's go ahead and take our first break. And when we come back from our break, we will dive into our joints, our discussion of those articulations. So we will restart at 9.15 and I will start the recording at that point. All righty, questions on any of that? All right, I will see you in 15 minutes then. So as I mentioned, the last part that we need to discuss uh, about uh, this section, and we'll do it today and also on Wednesday, is to talk about joints. The last major uh, concept of our physiological processes of our bones would allow to make our bones the movable, flexible things that they are, or our skeleton, I should say that. Again, it's all about vocabulary. Uh, we can term joint is an appropriate term, but so is the term articulation, so is the term arthrosis. And of course, those are the singular articulations and arthroses, ES versus IS is the plural. Again, always fun with vocabulary. Basically, a joint is defined by the connective tissue that holds two bones together. So we have two bones, bone A and bone B, and there is going to be some connective tissue component that holds the two of these together, typically something flexible, but of course, keyword there being typically, mostly, right? Because mostly means not all, but typically it's going to be, and then that's how we define it. Of course, like many things we define in this class, we are going to uh, describe them uh, both structurally and functionally. And of course, as we've talked about, the study of joints is the field of arthrology, whereas the study of the movements that the joints allow is the field of kinesiology. And this is actually gonna be a great lead into the next part of the class when we move on to the muscular system. Because as we move on to the muscular system, the, uh, again, it's all about vocabulary, the names for the appropriate terms for the movements that joints allow are going to be the actions that we are going to learn for the muscles as we move on to the next section of this class. Now, as I mentioned, there are two ways we can classify our joints. We can classify them functionally and we can classify them structurally. And actually let's switch to the whiteboard to do this because I like doing this one on the board. We'll clear all of that and let's get some definitions down. Again, one of the ways we can identify our bones is a functional classification. Functional classification basically is the degree of movement that the joint allows. And conveniently enough, there are three specific functional classifications. So on the lab exam, when I show you a picture of a joint and I ask you to identify the functional classification of that joint, how many possible answers are there? Three, there you go, exactly. So let's draw a nice big solid line, right like that. And cheat, move it over a teeny bit more, perfect. There are three. The first of these is what is known as a synarthrosis. As I said, one of the funds in this section is uh, all of the vocabulary. But remember, arthrosis is just another name for a joint. 
So a synarthrosis is a syn joint. And how much movement, what does syn usually refer to? It's immovable. Exactly. So basically a synarthrosis, and again, fun with vocabulary, synarthrosis is the singular of the noun. Synarthroses is the plural of the noun. And synarthritic is the adjective. A synarthritic joint, as was mentioned, allows no movement. Have we identified a synarthritic joint so far in this class? Yeah, the ones in our skull. What did we call those joints between the bones of our skull again? Sutures, sutures absolutely. Those sutures are synarthritic. They do, are, are, do not allow any movement to occur. All right, the next one is an, there you go amphiarthrosis oops uh, amphiarthrosis would be the plural or amphiarthritic would be the adjective and how much movement does an amphiarthrosis allow um. yeah it's going to allow limited movement Right, a small range of limited movement, right? Again, when I, oops, I spelled it wrong. When I say amphi, arthrosis we know still means joint. When I say amphi, what do you think of? Where have you heard that prefix amphi before? Amphitheater. Okay, amphitheater, where else? Amphibian, that's the one that always comes to mind for me. Uh -huh. What's special about amphibians? Uh, a reptilian. Well, are they are they truly a reptilian? Do they spend all their time a life on land or all their life in water? In water. No, it's half and half, and that's really what amphi means. Amphi means half and half. So this is kind of a half joint. It allows some limited range of motion. And then our third functional classification Diarthrosis. is a diarthrosis. And a diarthrosis allows a free range of motion. However, it is important to note it can be restricted uh, by the axis, All right? Perfect example is here in my finger. Here in my finger, between my phalanges, I have a free range of motion for that joint. So if we look at this joint right here, I have this free range of motion between those two phalanges and how they can move. However, while I'm sitting here moving my finger, should it ever go off to the side like this? No, if it does, I'm running to the doctor immediately as a result of that. So while it can go up and down, right, there's no left or right movement to my uh, phalanges in that way. A little different, from what we see here in the joint between the phalanges and the metacarpal. Here, notice I can go up and down, but I can also go back and forth. So there can be single axial or biaxial or multiaxial movements that our diarthroses can allow. So diarthroses allow a free range of motion, but they can be restricted by the axis. And there you go, just that simple. Three functional classifications, indicating how much movement a joint will allow. All right, questions on that? Excellent, so let's talk about our second classification, structural classification. A structural classification basically is defined by the type of tissue that forms the joint. But we do have to add a second criteria and the presence of a joint cavity. 
if there is a joint cavity present. And as it turns out, there are four structural classifications. The first structural classification is a synostosis. Now, that doesn't tell us much in and of itself. And synostosis is the correct term to use. However, synostoses are commonly referred to as a bony joint. And if these are a bony joint, that may give you a hint at the type of connective tissue that holds them together. So what type of connective tissue do you think holds the two bones together with a synostosis? Dense regular connective tissue. Yes, which is why it's called bony. Ligaments a good guess as well. You guys are overthinking this. It is called a bony joint because what kind of connective tissue holds the two bones together? How about bone connective tissue? There you go, exactly. In this case, it is bone connective tissue that holds the bones together. There you go. The second structural classification is cartilaginous. And if it is cartilaginous, guess what kind of connective tissue holds the two bones together? Cartilage, there you go. The third structural classification is what we call fibrous. Guess what type of connective tissue holds the bones together with a fibrous joint? Fibrous. Yeah. So it's going to be a fibrous connective tissue. Oops. And the last is a synovial joint. Now, in a synovial joint, this is the one and only structural classification that has a joint cavity. And guess what type of membrane surrounds this joint to form that joint cavity? Synovial fluid. Exactly. Well, it's going to contain synovial fluid, but you're right. It is formed by the by A. Let's say it that way. Membrane. So we have a synovial membrane that wraps around it, forming that joint cavity. Right, and we'll know we'll talk about some of the other characteristics you find in a synovial joint as well. There you go. Those are. are structural classifications. Questions on that? But notice I left a lot of space here. And the reason I left a lot of space here is because when we are talking about structural classifications, it turns out that our structural classifications can have specific types of joints. As it turns out, our cartilaginous joints have two 
specific types. Now, let's think about this for a second. Cartilaginous joints is where a cartilage connective tissue holds the bones together. How many different cartilages did we have? Three, there you go, excellent. What were they? Island, what else? Come on, Allison, I see a mouth in it, but you gotta hit the uh, mute button so you can say it all out. Elastic, hyaline elastic and fiber cartilage. Perfect, excellent. So hyaline cartilage, fibro cartilage and elastic cartilage. Now elastic cartilage was the bendy one that you find here in your ear. Do you think this would be a good cartilage to hold bones together to form a joint? No, so that leaves with ju just two, hyaline cartilage and fibro cartilage. And conveniently enough, there are two specific types of cartilaginous joints. And so those two specific types involve those two specific tissues. For cartilage, uh, we have our first one, which is a synchondrosis. A synchondrosis is a cartilaginous, a specific type of cartilaginous joint where it is the hyaline cartilage. that holds the bones together. So let's go with A for that. And B is a symphysis. Oops. A symphysis which is where it is the fibrocartilage. There we go. All right. For our fibrous joints, there are three specific types. Uh, the first one of this is our friend, the suture. A suture is only found in the skull. And again, we have a thin fibrous me uh, a membrane. That holds the bones together. The second is a syndesmosis. With a syndesmosis, we actually have either a ligament. Remember, ligaments are dense, regular connective tissues. So that, would, that ligament would hold them together. Or actually, elastic ligaments can do it as well or what we call an interosseous membrane. That is going to hold them together. And then lastly, we have our gomphosis which is by far the most fun joint to say. The gumphosis is basically a peg and socket type of joint. And it is specifically for the teeth. Now, Again, when we learn the 80 bones of the axial skeleton or the 22 bones of the skull, did we talk about the teeth? 
No, because the teeth aren't bones. They are bone-ish. They are made up actually of primarily a uh, calcified matrix called dentin, which is kind of similar to our hardened calcified cartilage. And then as we know, the outer surface has that hydroxyapatite crystal, which is the same crystal that is found in bones, but doesn't have the collagen in it. So they are bone-like, but they're not actually bones. However, they are anchored into our mandible and our maxilla. So it is a joint between a bone-like structure and a bone. And so that bone-like structure in the bone, that peg and socket, tooth and jaw uh, joint, has a special name called a gum fossus. All righty. Now, notice we've gone through a lot of these so far, but when we talk about our functional classifications and our structural classifications, obviously they're clearly two totally different things. Functional classification is how much movement a joint allows. Structural classification is the type of tissue that holds them together. But do you think there is a relationship between these two? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? Yeah, does the structure of something affect its function? Absolutely. So when we look at all of these structural classifications, can we relate to them to a specific functional classification? Absolutely. So let's do that. Let's start easy. I'm gonna cheat and put this picture over here for now. There, down there. Perfect. Let's start easy. With a synostosis, where we have bone connective tissue holding the two bones together, what do you think the functional classification? Let's make that darker. What do you think the functional? It's too dark. I don't like that either. Um, all right, we'll go back to where we were. What do you think the functional classification of a synostosis is? Synarosis? Yeah, it's exactly. It's going to be a synarthrosis. All right, so again, call grandma up on the phone today, call her and tell her, hey, guess what, grandma? Synostoses are synarthritic, and she'll be very impressed. She'll send you $20 in the mail. But basically, all you've said is that when two bones are held together by bone connective tissue, they do not move. Excellent. What about a synchondrosis, where we have hyaline cartilage holding the two bones together. What do you think the functional classification there is? Amphiarthrosis. Amphi, do they allow flexibility of movement? Well, let's think, where might one of these joints be? We haven't really talked about the locations of these. So actually, let's look at the pictures. Let's actually do this. Let's stop what we're doing right now for a second. Let me go ahead and, un oops, no, didn't want to do that. I want to put that there. What I want to do is erase this. And let's actually look at the pretty pictures for these. We'll come back to this in a second. We did all of that. We did all of that. So let's start looking at the joints. All right. Starting first with a fibrous joint. With our fibrous joint, notice again, they don't have a synovial cavity. They have some type of fibrous connective tissue that holds them together. And they either allow little or no movement. We have a suture. Again, notice we have a dense fibrous connective tissue that is holding the two bones together. So based on that and what we know about sutures, what do you think the functional classification of a suture is? Do our bones of our skull move? No. So of course that is gonna be a synarthrosis. Again, I know the vocabulary can be a little scary, but the test is one week from today, guys. These should be easy questions to answer. Now, I know we have had the difficulty of not being able to hold these bones in your hand, but hopefully at this point, you've looked at a lot of pictures of real skulls. And as you've looked at these pictures of real skulls, have you noticed a dark fibrous connective tissue holding the two bones of the skull together? No. no, because one of the things that happens as we age is that those sutures actually ossify. 
osteoblasts continue to deposit more and more um, matrix into those spaces until that fibrous connective tissue, which after all is just a bunch of collagen fibers, completely ossifies. And if that sutural line completely ossifies, then technically wouldn't it be bone holding the two bones together? Yeah. So notice as we age, as our sutures ossify, they actually become synostoses. And of course, as we know, the functional classification of the synostosis is also a synarthrosis. All right. Excellent. Our second, oh, that's what I wanted to find. Hold on one second. <laughs> There it is. That's not good. Um, the virtual anatomy lab for uh, Cosmos River doesn't have the right chart that I want. All right, this will work for now. And then during the next break, I'll find it. OK, so let's look at this picture here. That's not fun. All right, we'll do it here. This will work. OK, all right. Sorry about that. Should have prepped that during the break. Wasn't thinking. All right. I assumed I would have it at the other place. All right. So our second fibrous type of joint is the syndesmosis, where we have a ligament or an interosseous membrane that holds it together. Notice here we have the example of a ligament. So we have a dense regular connective tissue where those collagen fibers are holding it together. However, when we have two parallel bones like the tibia and the fibula, this illustration doesn't show it, but the chart from the classroom does, and I'll demonstrate it here. There is a fibrous connective tissue membrane that will actually hold the diaphyses of this together with these two parallel bones. The other place you see this, and again, I don't have a good picture of it, but I will get it during the break is in the forearm. In the forearm, we have two parallel bones here as well. And so what'll happen is there will be this fibrous membrane that holds these together. And like I said, I will get you a good picture of it during the next break so we can see that. And this membrane holds the two bones together. Notice it allows the bones to move in relation to each other. You can squeeze your forearm bones right, they can twist back and forth, but it isn't necessarily a full range of motion. So if it isn't a full range of motion that it is allowing, then what would the functional classification of a syndesmosis be? Movable. Oh, great, excellent. 252 of your textbook shows a good example. Right, but not freely moving. Right, so just partially allowing limited movement. What was the fancy name for limited movement joint? There it is, an amphiarthrosis. Excellent, so it would be an amphiarthrosis. 
So syndesmoses are amphiarthroses. And here we see that example of the gum phosis. Again, as we talked about, notice here we see a fibrous ligament. This fibrous ligament is actually called the periodontal ligament that holds the tooth, which is a bone-like structure into the socket, ovioli, of the maxilla or mandible. And how wiggly should your teeth be inside of your jaw? Not at all, exactly. So they are a sin arthrosis. Oh, we're coming to the synchondrosis. We're going to hit that in a second. But the short answer to your question is that it is a uh, great question, Ellie, uh, is that uh, it is that it is a, a, a sin arthrosis. Synchondroses or synarthroses. So here's what happens when you're younger and you're losing your teeth. When you are losing your teeth, what is happening is that you have a grown up tooth down here that is pushing its way up. And as that occurs, your osteoblast and your phagocytes uh, start to break down the dentin, break down the matrix and remove the root of the tooth. And as you remove the root of the tooth, it becomes more wobbly, it is no longer anchored in place and it falls out and then the new tooth can grow up in its place. Right. Once of course that grown up tooth comes in, it might not necessarily be perfectly aligned. So what do we do to it? Put right. braces on it. There you go. Strap a bracket to it and then connect a wire to it. And what that does, and again, hopefully it doesn't occur in this angle, although it can. But if you think about it, what it's doing is it pulls on the tooth. And as it pulls on the tooth, it puts pressure on one side of the bone and less pressure on the other side. So if our wire and the bracket is trying to push the tooth this way, as that tooth is pushing against the bone, that will increase the osteoclast activity in this formation, helping to remove some of the bone in this area. And in this side here, we'll build up more bone. So we build up more bone on one side, less bone on the other, and that shifts the tooth in the location within the socket to try to get them aligned. Now, the one problem you have and the reason you have to wear them for such a long time is because at that dynamic pressure on the bone can, I mean, on the tooth can cause the tooth to bend. And if the tooth bends and doesn't actually move in the socket, then what's gonna happen is as soon as you remove that pressure, it's gonna go back to its base it was before. So you need to put enough pressure that it actually is able to align the root so that it is growing at that appropriate angle. All right. Excellent. So now let's get back to our cartilaginous joints as we were talking about. And this is why I wanted to use these examples. The very stereotypical example that people use for a, um, a synchondrosis is this joint here between that funky first rib and the manubrium. As we talked about, the reason we have ribs instead of just a bone tube is we need that flexibility to be able to bring the ribs up because as we bring the ribs up, uh, it basically uh, changes the volume, changes the space. And if you change the volume, you change the pressure. And if you change the pressure, air moves. You can think of it like the handle of a bucket. I always think of it as like a handle of a bucket. If you think of a handle of the bucket, that handle of the buckle, bucket swings up. And as it swings up, it changes the space that is inside there. And that is what's happening with this. But for that to occur, you need a pivot point. To get that swinging, you need a pivot point. And that's what we have here. Here with our first rib, we have a swinging point. And so we have that hyaline cartilage forming an immovable joint. However, technically a synchondrosis is where you have two bones held together by hyaline cartilage in between. And if you think about it, that's exactly what is occurring at the epiphyseal plate. 
at the epiphyseal plate, you have the epiphysis of a bone and the diaphysis of the bone being held together by hyaline cartilage. And this gets back to the question of function, right? With that epiphysis on the diaphysis, do you want it wobbling and moving around? No. No. So what is our functional classification of asynchondrosis going to be? Synarthrosis. There you go, asynarthrosis, exactly. Synarthrosis, yes. And let's, again, one more fun example. Notice, as we know, this epiphyseal plate doesn't stay a plate forever. Eventually, it ossifies, and when it ossifies, it becomes a thin line of compact bone holding the two bones together. So when it ossifies and completes, that epiphyseal line is an example of a synostosis, where we now have bone connective tissue holding the two pieces of bone together. Ooh. Notice when these things ossify, you have two bones held together by bone, you have a synostosis. All right, questions on that? All right, one more. Our symphysis, remember, as we talked about, is where we have fibrocartilage holding the two bones together. The classic example, and I think one we've already talked about in this class, is the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis is where we have fibrocartilage holding uh, the two pubic bones together, helping to form the pelvis. Notice what we see here in its entirety is the pelvis made up of both axial sacrum and coccyx and appendicular bones with the two oscoxa bones. I'm sure that's something that you've been talking about on your 30 point skeletal review when it tells you to make sure you talk about how this is neither an axial nor an appendicular skeleton, but involves both. But remember, we talked about here at the center, this pubic symphysis is a little bit of fibrocartilage that helps to hold this together, giving that structure, giving that uh, shape to the pelvis, because the pelvis is the structural weight-bearing component of the skeleton, or one of them anyway. Of course, as we also talked about, females get the honor and privilege of passing a basketball through that pelvis, right, through the true pelvis portion of it. And so one of the things that happens in pregnancy, especially late term pregnancy, some of the hormones that are produced loosen that pubic symphysis, making it even more flexible, giving it even more give, right? Allowing it more flexibility, more give to allow for the movement of the baby through that space. And of course that affects the stability of the pelvis, which is why pregnant women, especially late term pregnant women get a very distinctive gait to the way they walk. Notice I didn't say waddle. All right. Now, obviously the pubic symphysis is a symphysis, but where's another location where we find a good chunk of fibrocartilage? Nose. Well, nose isn't fibrocartilage, vertebrae, there you go. Right, remember we have these vertebrae here our vertebral column, and in between our vertebral column, don't we have big chunks of fibrocartilage? What do we call those big chunks of fibrocartilage between the vertebrae? Discs, the intervertebral discs. Those joints of those intervertebral discs holding the bodies of the two vertebrae together is another example of a symphysis. Notice, in fact, that all symphyses are on the midline of the body. Again, midline of the body isn't the only place you find fibrocartilage, but the only place you find are symphyses, the pubic symphysis and the intervertebral discs is on the midline of the body. And our vertebral column, our uh, pubic symphysis, do we want them to be completely immovable? No, we no. want diathrosis. Well, again, we don't necessarily want a diarthrosis. We don't want our pelvis swinging open, right? Our <laughs> vertebral column has some limited movement. So again, this is another example of where we have limited movement. 
So it is an amphiarthrosis. So let's go back to the table we were working on and fill it in. So what was the functional classification we found for the synchondroses? Like the first rib, like the epiphyseal plate, those were a? Synthrosis. Synarthrosis, excellent. What was the functional classification of a symphysis? Amphiarthrosis. What was the functional classification of a suture? Synarthrosis. What was the functional classification of a syndesmosis? Amphiarthrosis. Oops. And what was the functional classification of a gumphosis? Synarthrosis. Excellent. Perfect. Notice we have done three of our four structural classifications and all of their specific types. And notice something interesting. That interesting thing that I notice is that all of the structural classifications and specific types we've talked about so far are all either synarthroses or amphiarthroses. Notice none have them been have been diarthritic joints. And the reason for that is that only our synovial joints are diarthritic. So all diarthroses are synovial joints and only synovial joints. So all synovial joints and only synovial joints are diarthroses. And conversely, synovial joints are all diarthritic, are all diarthroses, and they're the only ones that are diarthroses. Oops. There we go. No, I did that really bad. No, I did diarthrosis. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So that makes it pretty easy. So if I show you any synovial joint, that synovial joint, you know, functionally has to be a diarthrosis. And if I ask you to identify a diarthritic joint, you know, they all have to be synovial joints. So that is the easy part. The one tricky part is how many specific types are there? of synovial joints? Six, exactly, six specific types. And again, they are gonna differ in their shapes of their articulating surfaces. And they are gonna differ in the range of motion. Well, let's say it this way, in the axes that they allow. So we've got our work cut out for us on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we are gonna need to talk about the uh, synovial joint, identify the anatomy of the synovial joint, and then identify the six specific types. And I believe if we go back here, perfect, there we go, to give you a head start as you look ahead here indeed are the six specific types of synovial joints. And like I said, we will talk about the basic anatomy of the synovial joints and then both the specific types, the shapes of their articulating surfaces and then the types of motion and the range of motions that they allow. 
All right, excellent. Questions on that? All right, we have our group presentations then. However, before we do our group presentations, like before, I want to do a brief introduction. So let's get our introduction done and out of the way. Then we will break you into your groups uh, and we'll take a short break. And then when we come back, your groups can be prepared to, prevent, pre, uh, to present. Again, today we are going to do the upper appendage. So that means the pectoral girdle and the upper limb. So if you're uh, one of those groups, you'll be presenting that. All right. But let's talk about the appendicular skeleton first. How many bones? How many named bones in the appendicular skeleton? I have two choices. You could count them all. There you go, excellent, 126 named bones. All right, we know that there are 206 total bones, named bones in the body. We knew there were 80 in the axial skeleton. So that means there's 126 named bones here. However, one of the key is that they're all paired bones. So really, if you think about it, you're only learning 63 new bones. because everything that is on the right side, you have on the left side. Of course, it's the mirror image. So of course that also means on the exam, when prompted, you need to be able to distinguish whether a bone is left or right. All right. On this exam, and this is probably a good place for a quick uh, divergence uh, from what we were talking about. As always, it is important to read the questions carefully. People often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. Read the question carefully so you can answer it correctly. Provide me with the information and only the information I ask for, but also provide me with all the information, right? If you think about it, for this test, there's only so many questions I can ask. For the majority of the test, it's going to be, these are the types of questions I can ask. Identify the bone. Identify the bone feature. All right? Identify the skull feature. Or, and again, skeletal feature. Remind me again what the difference between the skull feature and the skeletal feature is. Come on, someone tell me what the difference between a skull feature and a skeletal feature is, or it's gonna be the first question on the exam for everyone. Skull features are skeletal features within the skull only. Exactly. Both are made of two or more bones coming together. The only difference is a skull feature is a skeletal feature of the skull. So obviously I'm gonna ask for a skull feature if it's on the skull, if it's not in the skull, I'm going to ask for a skeletal feature, right? And of course, if I ask you for a skull or skeletal feature, I will ask you to identify the bones and or bone features that form the skull or skeletal feature. So again, we need to know the bones and bone features that form our skull and skeletal features. Excellent. I could ask you to identify whether the bone is left or right. And even though we did this a little bit on the skull, we did this once on the skull with the jaw, I can also point at a bone feature and I can ask you not to identify that bone feature, but identify the bone and bone feature that articulates with the labeled bone feature. So for instance, if I had a mandible,
And on the exam, I had an arrow pointing here. I could ask most of these questions. Identify the bone and bone feature. What bone and bone feature would this be? Come on, my drawing's not that bad. Is that the mandible condyle? Absolutely, that is the mandibular condyle. Now, notice, because it had mandible in the name, technically you're saying the bone and bone feature. So you could say mandibular condyle or the condyle of the mandible, right? So that would include bone and bone feature. However, if instead I had drawn my arrow here and asked you to say the bone and bone feature, what would you have to say there? Coronite process. Yeah, and again, Cornet process would get you partial credit because what'd you forget? Mandible. Name the mandible, right? Bone and bone feature. Notice mandible is not a part of the name of this. So it's better to just get in the habit of always putting the name, even if it's redundant. Mandibular condyle of the mandible, right? So there's question one. Bone and bone feature. Mandibular condyle of the mandible. But notice I could also ask you to identify the bone and bone feature that articulates it. What is the bone and bone feature that articulates with the mandibular condyle? Temporum mandibular joint. Nope, you've named the joint, but that's not what I'm asking you for. In fact, you're not gonna be responsible for the names of any of the joints. Well, I guess that's not entirely true. There's five joints you've had to learn four sutures and the pubic symphysis, but that didn't answer the question. I wanted the bone and bone feature that it articulates with. What is the bone and bone feature that this articulates with? Mandibular notch of the temporal bone? Close, it's not the mandibular notch though. What's it called? Temporal fossa of the temporal bone. There you go, mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. All right. We need to know how the bones relate with each other. That's what this whole 30 point uh, review you're doing is. We're spending so much time looking at the individual bones and thinking about all the bones and bone features of the little of the bones. We need to understand how these things go together. We need to know how tab A goes into slot B. And so that is how I will ask that question on the exam. It's why it's important to read the questions carefully because you could see this amazing picture on the exam and go, oh, that's clearly the mandibular condyle of the mandible and be all super excited and write that down. But you didn't read the question. And maybe the question said, identify the bone and bone feature that articulates with this bone feature. And then that would be the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. All right. So it's one of the things that we're gonna be emphasizing today understanding the relationship of these bones to each other. Now, just as the axial skeleton is comprised of primarily three structures, right? The skull, uh, the uh, vertebral column, and the bony thorax or the rib cage, there are four primary structures that make up the appendicular skeleton. They are the pectoral girdle, the upper limb, the pelvic girdle, and the lower limb. Now, I think hopefully limbs are obvious. You guys know what a limb is. So upper limb is your arm, lower limb is your leg. But what do we mean by the girdle? What does this term girdle mean? Does anybody know? It's like a circle. It can be. A, 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 a belt. I'm sorry, say again? A belt shape. So, that's commonly how we think of them, right? Like, again, luckily we're not in the classroom because normally in the classroom, I have to wear my girdle when I come in. Uh, but um, we think of it as that circular structure, restricting structure, but really what a girdle is, is a support structure. It's something that holds things together. And that's really what the girdle does. The job of the girdles is basically to connect the limb, whether it's upper or lower, to the axial skeleton. So obviously the pectoral girdle connects the arm to the axial skeleton and the pelvic girdle connects the leg to the axial skeleton. 
So this is a support structure. This is a holding together structure. And so the pectoral girdle holds the arm to the axial skeleton and the pelvic girdle holds the leg to the uh, axial skeleton. So those are things that we need to identify. The other important thing to think about is while there is some clear symmetry between the upper and the lower part of our skeleton, we are highly specialized in that we are uh, bipedal, meaning that we stand upright. So while unlike my cat or dog or mountain lion or whatever it is that I have as a pet, um, it walks on all fours, the function of our upper appendages is very different from the function of our lower appendages. Our legs, our lower appendages are weight bearing and they're specialized for that structure, specialized for that support, right? How long can you stand for? Ever, right? You can stand for that eight hour shift of sitting in that box collecting toll, you know, tolls from a toll booth right on the bridge. And you can stand there for eight hours for your whole shift if you needed to. How long can you hold yourself in a planking position for? Half a minute on a good day. There you go, excellent. Half a minute on a good day. And you're not even holding up all your weight when you're planking, right? You're not even holding up all your weight, but still we can't do that because our upper appendage is not specialized for weight bearing. It's specialized for dexterity. And so one of the big key differences we will see when we look at the upper structures from the lower structures is the upper structures are specialized for dexterity, for movement, whereas our lower ones are more, less movement, less flexible, but more structurally sound. And Allison, don't tell me that they sit. Look, never let facts get in the way of a good story. All right. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Questions on that? All right. Last thing before the break. Again, the nice thing about this is we can focus just on one side because whatever happens on one side is gonna be the same thing that happens on the other side. But every group that is presenting a bone does need to help us to be able to distinguish left and right to help us to be able to do that. So just like we did with the skull, let's identify the bones first, right? How many bones are in the pectoral girdle? Again, and just on one side, we'll focus on one side only. For one side only, how many bones are there in the pectoral girdle? Come on, if anything else, start randomly throwing out numbers or look at the picture and count. How many bones make up one pectoral girdle? Someone's presenting it today, they should know. Excellent, two, perfect. What are they? Clavicle and scapula. There you go, the clavicle and the scapula. What we commonly refer to as the collarbone and the shoulder blade. Are you gonna get away with terms like collarbone and shoulder blade on the exam? No, absolutely not. Clavicle and scapula. Again, and I think this illustration does a great job of showing this. How many joints does our pectoral girdle, this shoulder girdle, form with our axial skeleton? Is there one? One. This is it. Notice the scapula lines up along the back of the ribs, but it doesn't actually form a joint with it. That's why it's able to move back and forth and slide and move around. There's muscles, there's skin, there's ligaments and stuff holding it in place. But this right here is the only joint between our upper appendage and our axial skeleton. This is it. Has anyone broken their clavicle before and broken their collarbone, seen someone break their collarbone? My doctor had to break my son's clavicle bone. Yikes, ouch. So yeah, and then and someone else had it, right? When that happens, the whole arm kind of collapses in, right? Playing football, it often happens and the whole shoulder collapses in. That clavicle is the only thing that, the only bony structure that connects it to the, the axial skeleton, but it also is what gives the vertical axis. So when you break that bone, it just collapses in. Yikes, ouch. Those are some scary things you guys have done. 
excellent right so you see, you've seen that and you've experienced that it's it's kind of trippy when that occurs because the whole arm kind of collapses in it's not very structurally sound but again that's what gives us this huge range of motion and dexterity that we have with our upper appendage because this is the only bony connection all right excellent so let's talk about the upper arm then the upper limb how many bones in the upper arm? 28. Well, just the upper arm. I know you're trying to count them and put them all together, and we can do that if we need to. But how many bones in the upper arm? One. What One. Is it? Humerus. There you go. The funniest of all the bones. How many bones in the lower arm? Two. Two. Two parallel bones. What are they? Radius and ulna. How do you tell them apart? One is, one is uh, thin uh, and long. True, one is thin. Common, but I'm thinking in anatomical position. How Ra do you radius, tell? radius is uh, distal and ulnar is proximal. No, actually, they're both distal because they're both in the lower part of the arms. They're side by side. So what I'm saying, one side. One what I'm saying is, is like to each other. They're side to side to each other, but one of them is lateral and one of them is medial. Which one is lateral in anatomical position? Radius. Radius, because the radius is rad, right? There you go, radius is rad. Whereas the ulna is medial. It's on the pinky side. And that's how I remember it. Pinky, ulna, right? Ulna, pinky, pinky, ulna. P, U. It stinks having to learn all this stuff, right? So there you go. We have the radius and the ulna there in the arm. So again, Top and bottom, we want to be careful with, but the radius is rad. It's on the same side as the thumb. Absolutely. So that's an excellent way of doing that. Perfect. Now, we've said this before, but how many bones in the hand? We, get, we got away with a lot before, but now we have to be more precise. How many total bones in the entire hand? So we have eight bones, uh, like carpals. Okay, excellent. We have eight bones that are what we commonly refer to as the wrist. We'll see it's not truly the wrist, but you're right. Those eight bones collectively are known as the carpals. Although I know we have a group that will be presenting each individual bone to us. And what about the rest of the hand? So for each flange. I'm sorry, go ahead, Laura. 20 more. Five 20? more carpals and 15. Phalanges? Do we have 15 phalanges? No, no. 14, we have 14. 14 phalanges. 14 phalanges. We have that special thumb. 14 phalanges and then five in the palm, so 19. So yeah, so actually 27. So you were close, Allison. Maxim had it. 27 total in the hand. And so how many total in the whole upper appendage of the, uh, on one side? 19. 27, 20, 29, 31. 31? 33. 33? How about in between? I 30. count 20, 32. 32, there you go. Excellent. So there you go. So that's our job. Our job now for our groups is going to be to work together to present these uh, bones to help us to learn the bones and the bone features and also help us to understand how they relate to each other. All right, where are we time-wise? So it is 10.18, perfect. I wanna go ahead and give you a total of 20 minutes uh, to prepare for this. And it's gonna take me a minute or two to get the groups together. So let's call it 10.40. So at 10.40, we will come back. Uh, although what I'm gonna do is uh, break you up into your groups now. So what I would encourage you to do is go get a, uh, take a break, go to the bathroom, get something to eat or drink, and then uh, I should have the group set up when you come back so you can break off into your individual groups and we will uh, do our group presentations at that point. All right, any questions? All right, I will see you back here at 1040 with your group presentations.